Good evening, and welcome to the Women's Health Awareness Virtual Series, Real Talk with the Experts. I'm Dr. Joan Packenham, Chair of the Women's um, Awareness St Steering Committee, and on behalf of the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences, National Institutes of Health, the Women's Health Awareness Steering Committee, and our co-sponsors, the Durham Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and North Carolina Central University, we are extremely honored to have each of you with us this evening. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our annual Women's Health Awareness, Women's Wellness Conference, this virtual platform allows us to continue our mission of informing and empowering women to take responsibility for their health by being their own health advocates to understand their health options and to identify services and resources in an effort to increase health equity and prevent and or reduce poor health. Tonight's Real Talk webinar is titled, Is Social Distancing Keeping You Home? Protect your family's health, clean air in your home. Our overarching goal of this webinar is to learn about the everyday sources of poor indoor air quality and ways to protect our families. This is especially important during this pandemic as we are all spending more time in our homes. This slide quickly highlights our agenda. Our first speaker for this evening is our session chair and moderator, Ms. Nisha Graves. She will provide an overview on protecting your family's health, keeping the air clean in your home. In the next session, Dr. Terrence Collins and Mr. Brian Lester will speak on mold, the unwanted guest in our homes. After each session, we will have a lot of time for you to ask your important questions of the experts. Finally, we will wrap up tonight's webinar with important health resources, the raffle, and information for the January health webinar. Quickly, a few webinar reminders that we don't want you to forget. This session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to YouTube and the WHA website. American Sign Language and closed captioning services are being provided throughout this webinar. Evaluations will be sent immediately after the webinar via email. Please note, for completing the webinar and evaluation, you will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. A few housekeeping details. The Zoom question and answer or Q&A is located at the bottom of your Zoom window when it is full size. It has to be a full size window. Most of your controls are found in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. The Q&A will be used for all comments and questions. Closed captioning is provided during this webinar. During our question and answer session, please let your voice be heard through the Q&A box. Click on the Q&A icon to open it. Type your question in the Q&A box and use the thumbs up icon to like a question as this gives the question priority ranking during the question and answer session. If you would like to send your question anonymously, please check the send anonymously box to conceal your name. And then you hit enter to send your question. Our first speaker 
for this evening and chair for this webinar is Ms. Nisha Graves. Nisha is no stranger to women's health awareness as she has provided workshops during our annual Women's Health Conference. Nisha is an environmental health educator and is a passionate ed educator uh, for educating minorities and how to address indoor air quality concerns across North Carolina and beyond. She is the Environmental Health Outreach Manager for the Community Engagement Corps of the UNC Center for Environmental Health and Susceptibility at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. We are truly thankful and very fortunate to have her chair this webinar and speak on Protect Your Family's Health, Keeping the Air Clean in Your Home. I introduce to you Ms. Nisha Graves. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so, um, uh, uh, as you can see here, um, I really want to talk to start this presentation off. I want to start with really introducing today's session, um, particularly around, you know, the reasons why we care about air quality in our homes. Um, we put this image up here. Uh, we we uh, revised this image from the National Heart, Lung, and Biology Institute to show people what is happening when people are exposed, when their airways are exposed to um, contaminants like tobacco smoke, mold, and, and other um, things that can impair uh, our lung health. If you look at this image, you see at the very top, well, first of all, if you look on the left, you notice that um, the small little branches that look like they're protruding from the lungs are actually called bronchial tubes or the airways. And the image at the right, top right area um, of the slide shows how um, when a person has a healthy set of lungs and healthy bronchial tubes, there's plenty of air that can circulate in and out. Um, the muscles are nice and loose. They're not tightened around the airways, and, and people can easily breathe. If you look at the bubble image below it, that's, looking, that's showing what happens when a uh, person's bronchial tubes are exposed to a contaminant like tobacco smoke or mold or even um, cockroach droppings. Believe it or not, that's another asthma trigger. You notice that there's the buildup of mucus. The, um, the lining of the airway becomes um, red and inflamed. And then the muscles tighten around it, really making it difficult for air to get in and out of the airways in and out of the bronchial tubes. Another reason why this image is showing a grown woman, because we actually have this slide developed for small children and for grown women, but I'm showing this one with a grown woman because um, in light of today's session, I really wanted to point out how um, women, children prior to puberty it's usually young boys who are, um, have the severity of asthma, have more severity of asthma than girls, and new diagnoses. However, after puberty, for adult women, they actually show the increased severity of asthma and newer um, diagnoses of asthma. So that's why I thought it was important to kind of showcase even the diagram here is, is being one with a woman. Next slide. So looking at some of the health effects of uh, poor air quality in our homes, uh, there are a number of different things. You'll hear us refer some to asthma and allergies and other lung conditions like bronchitis or pneumonia. Um, but we also, um, in, in the work that we do on um, uh, 
the work that our center does on environmental health, asthma triggers in, in health. We also look at how some um, exposures can lead to the development of asthma. We do not know for sure how asthma is caused. It is a combination of our environment and our genetics. But there are some indoor contaminants that we've noticed from the time that women are pregnant with their children or when children are exposed after birth through their um, younger years up until eight, nine, 10 years old, research is showing that there are some contaminants that lead to the development or influence the development of asthma. So that's why we have that second bullet there. Poor concentration, poor school performance, missed time from school, those are other factors related to asthma and allergies and um, how um, a child's um, sc schooling can be impacted by um, that condition. In fact, in North Carolina, 25% of kids, who school-age kids um, who have asthma miss at least a week of school every year. So it, it is a, a factor, it is um, one of the strongest factors um, of children missing time from school during the school year, health-related factors. Weakened immunity, premature deaths, and you'll hear me talk about uh, carbon monoxide a little later as another condition that can, uh, another contaminant that can lead to death. And then um, it also leads to harm to multiple organs in the body. Next slide. So this slide I put up because uh, Dr. Collins and, and uh, Brian and I are, you know, we could talk for days about a number of these different uh, contaminants that can harm lung health and that can make it difficult for people to breathe, that can uh, um, deteriorate the indoor air quality in our homes. We don't have that kind of time today um, to talk about all of these different issues, but I just wanted to point out everything from mold to bug spray to fingernail polish to pet dander. There are just a number of different uh, impacts on indoor air quality that are in our everyday lives. And so that's why I thought it was important to show this slide. Next slide. One thing um, that research shows um, and that we'd like for everyone to keep in mind, and, and I will refer to it again when answering some of the questions that have already been sent to, um, to all of us as presenters. When you're dealing with air quality, particularly for people with respiratory, respiratory, respiratory conditions like asthma and allergies, the most effective way to keep the air clean in your home and to improve asthma outcomes or other outcomes related to your respiratory health has been proven um, to be most effective when you use a multi-step approach. So this slide, for example, is showing what a health professional might talk to her, a, a patient of hers about if she's dealing with dust mites. She would take a multi-step approach in telling her to use dust mite covers on the pillow and the mattress to make sure the HVAC system is working properly to properly clean around the home, which uh, in this case is wet cleaning, and then just some assessment and education that a, a, a health professional might have with a child. But the point is when a person takes action uh, in a multi-step approach to deal with some of the issues that exist in our homes, uh, those are the most successful um, those show us the most successful outcomes. In fact, research is showing that nearly $2,000 can be saved for a person who has asthma every year if they take some of these steps related to their environment to help um, uh, keep from their, uh, to 
uh, sorry, to control their asthma and to manage their asthma. Okay, next slide. So now I will go into my presentation after sort of introducing some of the basic reasons for why we uh, are concerned about indoor air quality. I'm going to highlight, based on my discussion with the coordinators for tonight's session, I'm going to highlight three um, specific sources of poor indoor air quality um, that can exist in our homes, our schools, and, and in, um, you know, our broader community. Um, and uh, those entail carbon monoxide, consumer products that will have formaldehyde in them, and then vaping, which tends to be an emerging um, environmental health issue, not only at the University of North Carolina, but at a number of different environmental health sciences uh, research centers all over the country. Next slide. So I'll start off talking about formaldehyde and the fact that it can um, worsen lung health um, for not just for asthma patients, but for people with allergies and for those of us who have none of neither of those conditions, neither allergies nor uh, asthma. And so, um, but formaldehyde, and I think it surprises people because they think of formaldehyde as what people use to embalm <laughs> dead people. Um, but formaldehyde exists, as you can see from this slide, in a lot of our everyday products. Pressed wood furniture, carpet, rugs, fingernail polish, fingernail polish remover, air fresheners, and when I say air fresheners, I mean the spray, the plug-ins, um, uh, so a number of different types of, of um, things that we put in the air to create certain types of scents. The scented candles are another um, source of formaldehyde. So there's just a number of different consumer products that can exacerbate or worsen. Uh, when I say exacerbate, I'm meaning, I mean that it can worsen our lung health. Um, formaldehyde is important because it is, according to the Institute of Medicine, about five years ago, they issued a report they were saying that formaldehyde in a non-work setting can cause asthma attacks. So if you have a person who works in maintenance or custodial work and he's exposed or she is exposed to chemicals that have formaldehyde in them, it might not surprise anyone that if you're working eight hours a day around those chemicals, you can have an adverse reaction to them. But now, as of 2015, the Institute of Medicine is saying, we realize of these products um, in our homes, in a non-work environment, non-occupational environment, can also uh, cause damage to our lungs and harm to our lung health. Next slide. So what do we do about it? There are a number of different things that uh, people can do to try to reduce the existence of formaldehyde in their homes. You'll hear a lot today, not just from me, but from other presenters about ventilation and the importance of uh, having clean air come into your home. And you see from this image that uh, on the right side, just opening the windows or out some of the products that you are purchasing. A lot of people talk about the new car smell. Well, you don't really want that new car smell because that represents some of those chemicals that you're exposing your lungs to. And so um, if you can't help but to have some of those products, then you want to um, air them out for a day or two before into a closed environment, open your windows. Um, you also want to look 
or products that are um, identified as low VOC products, meaning uh, products that have little to no um, volatile organic compounds. And so in a nutshell, what that really means is you don't have the, the, the gases and chemicals that are produced from uh, using some of these products like fingernail polish remover, paint, and other, other products that have chemical fumes. Um, and thirdly, um, also on the slide here, is making sure you are properly changing out the HVAC filter in your home to help pull some of those contaminants out of the air in your home. So that, in a nutshell, um, sort of sh I'm sharing with you some of the things you can do to reduce the likelihood of formaldehyde impairing your lung health um, in your home. Next slide. Carbon monoxide is the next issue um, that I want to talk about, and it is um, called the silent killer. That is a, a really unfortunate name, but it is a, a, you know, an accurate name for it because it has no taste and no smell. Um, so people may be exposed to carbon monoxide and never realize it until they are severely harmed by it. Carbon monoxide is um, created from fuel burning um, appliances um, or from burning fuel like wood in your fireplace um, or in your wood stove. Unvented gas stoves and ovens, um, kerosene heaters, um, boilers and furnaces. So anything that is uh, burning fuel is um, likely to be producing carbon monoxide. Um, carbon monoxide travels from the air into our bodies very, very quickly. And although we're talking today, I talked a lot about lung health, it's important to know that carbon monoxide is um, also dangerous for the heart, the blood, our brain, our muscles. So it can travel through the body very, very quickly. Um, I do want to say one thing about an additional contaminant that exists in gas appliances, and that is nitrogen dioxide. That is actually an asthma trigger um, that exists also in gas burning appliances. And so when I talk about carbon monoxide, I'm often talking about nitrogen dioxide too, and the harm that it can do to lungs. Treatment for carbon monoxide is oxygen. That's why when you um, read or hear about your carbon monoxide alarms or warnings around carbon monoxide to run outside and get clean air. That's what they're saying. You, you want to fill your body with clean air as quickly as possible um, to offset some of the damage from carbon monoxide. Symptoms for carbon monoxide poisoning can worsen over time much you're exposed to and how long you're exposed to it. So it can go from having light headaches and nausea to being unconscious, having, uh, um, having a coma or even death. So it does escalate. The, the condition around carbon monoxide does escalate or worsen. Okay, next slide. So what do you do to limit the exposure to carbon monoxide? We have listed here some do's and don'ts. Um, you want to circulate clean air throughout your home as much as possible. So you need to be sure that you're, you have proper ventilation. As you can see with this woman in this image, that blue arrow is pointing to the exhaust fan over her gas stove. You want your exhaust fan to um, release the, the gas from your gas stove to the outdoors, to the outside, and not around your home. So it's important to run your exhaust fan when you are cooking, boiling water, or, you know, general use of your, your gas stove and gas oven. You want to install a carbon monoxide alarm on every floor of your home. 
and most certainly outside the bedroom because you want to be alarmed to the point that you know you have to get out of your home when you hear that alarm. That means you have a dangerous level of carbon monoxide in your home. Um, as I said before, gas stoves and appliances should vent to the outside and you should run your exhaust fan. For people who don't know this, one trick that we learned from the National Center for Healthy Housing was if you want to test your exhaust fan, put a sheet of toilet paper up against the fan, turn on the fan, and if it sucks it up, that means that the exhaust fan is working properly to provide ventilation in your kitchen. Things you should not do, um, you don't want to use portable gas stoves indoors. That includes your grill um, and, and other appliances like that that should not be used indoors and should not be used in a closed environment like your garage. Um, don't use the oven as a source of heat. We run into a lot of people, and, and maybe during this time of year, this is more prevalent where people may use their uh, gas ovens as a source of heat. That is releasing that carbon monoxide into the uh, air in your home. And then don't smoke in the home because smoking produces additional carbon monoxide poison. Okay? Next slide. The final um, topic I want to talk about is vaping. It is an emerging issue that in North Carolina and throughout the country, a lot of programs like mine are translating the research that um, is uh, showing how rapidly this is growing and harming young people and young adults. And by young people, I mean as young as middle school and high school. So um, the Surgeon General, um, the U.S. Surgeon General uh, has reported that much of the reason for young people being um, enticed uh, or interested in vaping is because of the flavors of vaping, uh, vaping liquids. You see in the middle of this image little bottles of liquid, and those are little bottles that represent different flavors um, uh, of, of vaping uh, liquids that are used in vape pens and uh, vaping devices. Um, research shows that when people are using e-cigarettes or vaping, and for those of you who don't know, that is one and the same. Using e-cigarettes or vaping is the same thing. For people who use that, they are actually damaging the genes in their lungs, in the cells of their lungs, to the point that they can't do a good job of fighting upper respiratory illnesses. So it actually harms the immunity um, that your lungs have to fight against disease when people are using, when people are vaping, particularly some of the vaping liquids um, and flavorings that are used. <clears throat> I thought it would be interesting to show this image on the right of Dr. Alona Jaspers. And she's putting a new device she has developed, a small paper uh, strip that she's inserting into another researcher. We would not show this if that was a real study subject. But this is another researcher. She was demonstrating the use of a nasal strip she has developed to detect um, the uh, contaminants that can get into the lungs and into the nasal passageways. And uh, so I just wanted to show that as um, our, how um, UNC Chapel Hill is working to develop devices and innovative research tools that help us to understand how vaping and other contaminants can harm the lungs. Next slide. These are just some images of uh, vaping devices. They continue to evolve. Some of them may surprise you. The three images in the top right corner are 
almost considered antiquated at this point. They're, um, they are among some of the earlier models of um, e-cigarettes. But the Juul is very popular now and has been uh, for a couple of years. Um, each pod that you see, each little colored pod that you see um, uh, next to the image of the Juul, pen, Juul device is actually has enough nicotine in it to equal a full pack of cigarettes. So there is concern about the amount of nicotine that people are exposed to when they are using e-cigarettes or e-cigarettes or vaping devices. The Puffet looks like an asthma inhaler. The Surin Drop looks like a paperweight. Um, so these are different devices that have different looks to them, but they are all e-cigarettes. Um, and, and I just wanted to showcase because I thought many of you may be parents of younger kids who would want to know about some of the devices that are being produced um, um, right now for, for vaping. I do want to say also there's the excuse that vaping is just vaping liquid. But please understand that um, vaping liquids or, or vaping water, vaping liquids actually have formaldehyde, nicotine, heavy metals like lead and other contaminants in them. So just understand that, um, you know, the argument that, oh, I'm just vaping water, that is not true. You're actually inhaling contaminants. Next slide. And I just want to say there are 35 million people all over the country who are addicted to nicotine, um, which is often sold in many vaping devices and certainly exists in cigarettes. So we always showcase uh, resources by the North Carolina Tobacco Prevention Program and by, and the, including the Quit Line, uh, North Carolina line, because it's important to know that there are resources for the smoker or the person who's using e-cigarettes, or for the family or health professional who may be working with that smoker to try to help them quit. And I thought the middle slide would be important to showcase because there is emerging research on third-hand cigarette smoke. And that is cigarette smoke or tobacco smoke that you cannot see, but it exists in our car seats, our carpet, our couches, and other um, um, uh, products in our home, we may not be able to see it, but the residual effect of the use of cigarettes can still cause some harm to our lung health. Okay, and really quickly, I just want to showcase, because I think my time is running out. Uh, next slide. This is the um, uh, website for the UNC Center for Environmental Health and Susceptibility, and that's the program that I work with to produce our asthma and healthy homes outreach. Next slide. Next, thank you. The North, back one. The North Carolina Healthy Homes website, as you see right here, has a number of resources on carbon monoxide, chemical irritants, mold and moisture and other contaminants that we'll be talking about tonight and, and beyond. There, there are lots of resources on this website and we encourage you to, to take a look at it. Next slide. On that slide and related to how Dr. Packingham was introducing today's session, we know that many people are cooped up in their homes and one of the reason why, reasons why you joined uh, this session tonight was because you want to make sure the air quality in your home um, is, is healthy because you are cooped up in your homes and you are um, uh, having to be in your homes more often than ever before. And I realized that we had a lot of questions that were presented before the session on how to deal with air quality and COVID-19. And um, I just want to point out this resource, which will also be shared on the WHA uh, resources webpage. 
this resource is a um, number of different materials that we have compiled on the North Carolina Healthy Homes website to showcase um, things about cleaners and air quality and um, recommendations from organizations like the World Health Organization and the CDC uh, around protecting yourself, protecting your family, and, and addressing COVID-19 concerns. So I just wanted to point that slide out. Next slide. And again, uh, Dr. Pack, Dr. Packingham mentioned it before, but here is the WHA um, resources um, page um, that we want to make sure everyone uh, visits as frequently as you can to get not only resources related to today's conversation, but also um, uh, um, follow-up resources that uh, myself and other panelists will, will provide as we get questions from all of you. Next slide. Here's my contact information. Uh, please feel free to um, email me with any questions. Those are the websites that I mentioned before. Next slide. And I also want to make sure we introduce um, our next panelist um, uh, uh, who will be talking about mold, the unwanted guest in our homes, Dr. Terrence Collins and Mr. Brian Lester. Um, Terrence, thank you. Dr. Collins is the director of the Institute for Green Science. He's also the Teresa Hines Professor of Green Chemistry at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, his expertise um, as a scholar, an educator, and an inventor um, around mold and, and other um, environmental health issues. He's the lead designer and developer and inventor um, of TAML Catalyst, which enable numerous technologies, including a mold cleaning application. And he's developed, he's been developing and teaching the first course since 1992 in green chemistry. Um, he continues to develop this course to steer the evolution of the field toward the big problems around chemical sustainability. Um, and um, that course today is called Chemistry and Sustainability. Next slide. And Brian Lester. Um, is the president of Indiana Mold Remediation um, in Indiana. His expertise entails 22 years of experience in cleaning, restoring, and remediating uh, remediation um, around indoor environmental problems, including mold. Um, and his primary focus has been around understanding the unique needs of individuals and uh, formulating a plan to reach um, goals within the budgets of homeowners that he works with and, and project man, property managers that he works with. Next slide. Okay. In the interest of time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Collins and uh, Mr. Lester. Well, thank you very much, Nisha. That really was, uh, that was a beautiful talk. And uh, packed in there was an awful lot of the things that you really know to pr protect your family fr from air problems in the, in the house. I, th I thought you did a wonderful job. Um, so we're talking about mold, the unwanted guest in our homes. Next slide, please. And the, out, we have these goals. We want to describe mold problems while pointing you to high quality online advice. We want to describe mold market solutions, the things that you can get today to help you. We want to in, introduce our developing solution. It's really quite remarkable, as you will see. And well, something that really, uh, I, I want to spend a little bit of time on at the end that I think is very important. I mean, don't you kind of feel like you're being left to do this all by yourself. You're getting this wonderful help from NIEHS, but still when you're out there in your homes and you're worried about the health of your 
children and your your families, etc., and all of these burdens are, are upon you, um, you, we ought to be doing better as a country than we are. We really do not have any national or state um, directives that really uh, help you or, or, or guide you in the sense of having real teeth that cause things to happen. And I want to talk about that because it's not the case in many other countries. They do a much better job of this than the United States does. And then finally, uh, we want to talk with you. So if I could go to the next slide, please. And I'm going to turn it over to Brian. But before I s say anything, I mean, I've known Brian for over a decade. He's an incredibly creative fellow um, and has invented the technology that or developed the technology that you'll see coming up shortly. Um, one of the things about him is he, he really respects his clients. He really works with them so that he doesn't break their bank uh, or scare them unnecessarily. Um, and I think this is just a wonderful thing that he does in Indianapolis where he works. So I'm going to turn it over to Brian, who's going to tell you all about mold for a little bit. <laughs> all about it. Thanks, Terry. Thank you, Nisha. That was fantastic. Um, I'm Brian. I'm, I'm the mold guy. That's what I'm known as around here. I've been doing this for a very long time. And I'm here to talk to you about mold. Most of you have heard of it. Some of you may be concerned about it. Um, but one of the things that we want to start with is that unlike a lot of environmental problems, mold is everywhere. It's not something that we're going to completely escape. It's part of every environment that we um, are part of. So we're all exposed to mold at different levels and at different, in, at different times and in different ways. Um, go ahead and advance the slide. So everybody knows what a bad case of mold looks like, or most of us do. They're not hard to see. We've got a couple pictures here from jobs that we've done. Um, it, when you have mold like this, it's pretty easy to detect and to know that you have a problem. Um, if you've got a water damage leak in a wall, or if you've got some mold that's growing on the carpet or the backside of the carpet, that's actually a, the, the arm of a chair that I looked at a couple of weeks ago. But uh, mold that's in this format is pretty easy to see, but it's not always that way. So you can develop mold problems in your home, your apartment, or your office that are not quite as readily visible as these are. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So how do you know if you have mold? Well, we've already talked about how easy it is to find it if it's out in the open. Here we've got a couple of pictures that show you that it can hide in places that you wouldn't see or that you wouldn't anticipate. That first photo there is mold that's growing behind some vinyl paper. Um, that's a result of some condensation moisture on the back of that wall. So water got trapped behind the paper. Nobody knew it was there until we started digging for it. And you can get mold in uh, one area of the home and then it can be distributed uh, through the HVAC system. So you see there, there's a picture of that red mold growing around it. And uh, that's primarily from condensation moisture. Most of us know when we have a mold problem because there's a musty smell. So one of the questions that I saw earlier was it, were we, whether or not we were going to address mold in a garage. Well, there it is. I'm addressing it. So there, there can be musty smells in garages or barns. A lot of times you'll hear people that will say, it just smells like a basement. Well, your basement shouldn't just smell like a basement. It shouldn't smell musty. That's generally an indication that there's some type of a mold problem there. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So one of the things that we do, uh, Terry mentioned it kindly, is that we try to work with clients um, and individuals in understanding their specific situation and then formulating a plan that meets their needs. Um, it's definitely true that in lower income housing, um, there's a, there is a disparity where these problems go unaddressed. So landlords can cover them up or homeowners that don't have the resources to necessarily take care of problems. Um, are left with a significant amount of mold growth or more mold problems in their home, which does impact their health. But one of the first things that we want to do whenever we're dealing with a mold problem is deal with the moisture problem. 
So if you've got a plumbing leak or water that's draining in through the foundation, um, if you've got uh, elevated humidity in the home, you have to address the moisture problem before you can deal with the mold problem, usually. That's not always the case, but that's generally the case. Uh, the EPA and the CDC both would say that the key to mold control is moisture control. Go ahead and advance this slide. So if you've got something that's heavily contaminated, if you remember from the first slide um, where I began speaking, we had that very uh, moldy surface on the wall. Something that gets contaminated that bad generally needs to be removed. So porous materials, drywall carpeting, if you've got fabric items that have got heavy mold growth on them, those can be very challenging to rid of mold. And if possible, when, when the uh, resources are available and the, the um, means are available, you generally want to remove and discard those heavier damaged items. But for lighter mold growth, a lot of times the solution is just cleaning. So one of the most common places that you get mold growing is on the bathroom ceiling or um, around windows uh, in the colder months where condensation has allowed mold to grow there. Soap and water is generally recommended. You can wash with cleaners that have got a salt to them, a carbonate salt or a borate salt. That would be like baking soda or uh, borax. Those both can help prevent mold problems in the future. They're fairly safe and they're easy to come across. If you've got someone that's got um, some type of immune system disorder or uh, asthmatic, sanitizing is not a problem and it's actually encouraged. Uh, the EPA and the CDC still recommend using mild bleach solutions on their website. You can use a peroxide-based solution like hydrogen peroxide, um, but there's lots of different sanitizers on the market right now um, that you can use to sanitize the surface after you've removed heavily damaged materials and after you've cleaned it, then you can sanitize surfaces. If it's a bigger problem, so generally speaking, if you've got more than about 10 square feet of mold growth, that's uh, about the size of, the, of a coffee table uh, surface. If it's more than that, then you might wanna consider consulting with someone, a professional. Um, here in uh, Indiana, we can call the local health department and for larger areas of mold growth like that, and they'll come out and investigate and they, they, they will force a landlord to correct moisture problems, but they may not necessarily um, force them to resolve the mold problem adequately. So it's, it's certainly something that we are still working towards. Next slide. So uh, one of the goals that we have is to resolve mold problems in a more cost effective and time efficient way and to make them more readily accessible. And one of the um, goals that I had many years ago was I wanted to be able to wave a magic wand and make mold disappear, um, which seems a bit far-fetched, but you know, you got to start somewhere. So I developed this uh, process, this product, and it's not uncommon um, for mold remediation contractors to use it now. And we went ahead and put a video together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play that video. Maybe. So one of the problems, I guess, is that the video doesn't transfer very well. So ah. you will... Um, well, you can look at the video slides, so the picture of it, and uh, we'll provide a link you, later on. You can look at it on YouTube. But um, there, to the right in front of the technician that's uh, spraying that uh, cleaner on the wood surface, you can see that there's a clean section there, and then straight ahead of them, there's a, a very moldy section. The clean section looked like that moldy section just a moment before. So we were able to create this product that we could spray on the surface and it's fairly effective at eliminating surface mold growth and getting rid of the underlying staining. Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's a bleach based product, which is something that uh, Terry and I are working around. We're, we're working towards a safer solution, but the goal is to create products that can eliminate a lot of these mold problems very easily. In this particular situation, we're dealing with mold in an attic space, um, which doesn't always impact the interior of the home, but it, it certainly can. Uh, if we can't do the video, we'll just jump to the next slide. I think, Terry, you wanted to talk about some of the where we're headed. Yeah, so uh, thank, 
thank you, uh, thank you very much, Brian. Uh, it's a pity the video didn't play because uh, it is really cool to watch. Uh, essentially, the black color disappears in seconds on uh, receiving the solution. Um, and that was, that's quite an old video. Brian uses much less spray and much less uh, bleach uh, with the, our special catalyst in there uh, uh, the, t today. But as we do, as we, uh, I've spent very many decades <laughs> designing catalysts to, to work better, to actually mimic the enzymes that are in your body that use oxygen or hydrogen peroxide uh, to really burn things, uh, to, to oxidize them. And we've got very good at that. And we have had a major, another major breakthrough, really, with a whole series of them down the decades where we now have catalysts that are way better than the one that was used in that product. And we, we can be pretty confident that we will be able to use these if I can have the next point. Um, through a company that you see its logo here, Sudoc, um, LLC, it was formed a few months ago. Uh, it has the most incredible team of people. Brian is a member of the team helping us as a consultant. Um, and it has, uh, wonderful investors and where we are using this to we, we're pretty sure we can develop something that's not only the magic wand that um brian has seen you but if you've seen if you've seen the uh, the harry potter movies it, it's the super wand um where hey, Terry, they have that video they were they're able to get that video uploaded oh why don't you go back and that'll be great if we go back and look at it, it's worth looking at it's a cool video. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks guys for getting that going. That's really good. Um, and so, so, so we want to get, that's a magic wand. And I think Brian would agree that it's by far the cheapest way to get uh, rid of mold in an attic space such as that, as well as many others um, compared to what's typically out there on the market. Uh, but we're moving ahead with, with an, I think it would be an even better product. Pretty sure of that. And it'll become available after we pass it through the appropriate EPA registration uh, for general use. Uh, next slide, please. Well, this is a statement that was made by a rather famous British Prime Minister. And okay, we had, America had its tiff with the Brits, but it doesn't mean to say that their Prime Ministers can't say really good things from time to time. And here we have the health of the people is really the foundation on, upon which all of their happiness and all of their powers as a state depend. And I don't think we pay enough attention into, in the United States to worrying about the health of the people. We having the struggle, of course, with, with um, insurance, health insurance, but it's more than that. Um, this mold problem is something that's relatively easy to, to address. The estimated cost of mold illness is about 20 billion per year in the United States. This is something that you could make go away with a fraction of that 20 billion while making people happier. But we need a national strategy. We need a statewide strategy. I, I urge people that are seeing this that, that have, have influence to think about that. We can really help people a lot that way. Next slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> We're done.
Great. Thank you so much. And you see the contact information for Dr. Collins and for Brian right there uh, on that slide. We, we hope you'll take advantage of contacting either of the three of us. I want to jump into the um, questions that <coughs> people submitted for tonight and some of the questions that were submitted live. I'm going to show my face also. Okay. Um, so there were quite a few questions <coughs> about using filters and what you should do when you're purchasing filters for your HVAC system. Um, people asked questions that referred to what type should I use, how much should I be paying, how often should I change it out. Um, and so <coughs> I just want to say I'm going to try to answer all of these questions in one nutshell. Um, when you are purchasing the filter for your um, HVAC system, you want to make sure, number one, that you are getting the proper size um, filter for your, your system. You want to make sure that you are installing it um, and um, changing it based on instructions from the manufacturer. So if it's recommended that you change it out every 30 days or 60 days or 90 days, we would initially tell people, follow those instructions. I had one question from someone who said, so what happens if, if maybe I see a lot of gook or a lot of dust in my filter and I've changed it a month earlier than normal? Uh, the manufacturer might recommend changing it every three months, but <clears throat> after two months, you notice a problem. Well, that's when it's probably time to get your HVAC system checked um, because if you're seeing more dust than you should see uh, in your filter that early, then it could be you're using the wrong size filter <clears throat> for your system, um, or you could be um, or the system itself could be uh, could have a problem. So there are a number of different reasons why you might see problems with your filter if you notice that you need to change it earlier. Um, some people have asked questions about, well, what if the filter um, has um, says that it will protect you from certain allergens? Yes, most packaging nowadays will show um, what the filters will protect you from, um, whether it's um, dust mites, pollen, or what have you. Um, a lot of packaging on, on uh, filter package, filters now will show you that. So, so I got a lot of questions around uh, filters um, today, uh, more than I've ever seen in a workshop, actually. Um, uh, the next question I got, and I think... Could I just add a little bit to that? Sure. Uh, because, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 there are multiple kinds of filters. There's the HEPA filter that's mm -hmm. very, very good for removing particulate matter. But you will actually find today, that they're, you know, they're not super cheap, but they're not wickedly expensive, uh, quite sizable air filters that you can put in your home that will also pull out chemicals. And I have one of these and it has an activated carbon filter as well as a HEPA filter, it's three or four stages. It costs about $200 um, to, to buy, which is respectable, but um, you can, several things. You can, you know, when the sun shines through the window and you see all the dust hanging in the air that you never normally see, you run the sucker and that's not there. And then the second thing is if you sit down near it with a glass of wine, it tells you when it's sensing chemicals and getting rid of them. It lights up like a shot. Or if you have an orange beside it, it lights up like a shot. Uh, and the claims are probably, the claims of the manufacturers are probably correct. So you can, you can go a lot of the way to handling um, mold problems in your house and related things such as Nisha has so beautifully talked about with a good, uh, mobile um, uh, air, air filtering system. Thank you, Nisha. Sure. Another. Can I say something real quick? Sure. 
if you uh, if if your budget doesn't allow for that, so there are times when two hundred dollars is is more than people have available in any one given time. I, I've been there. <laughs> I, I've had those th those months. <laughs> um, you can buy an allergen filter for your furnace, which has that same technology in it. It has the carbon fil uh, carbon filtration in it, and uh, it'll help to remove um, VOCs. Um, the musty smells that mold produce, as well as the formaldehyde that Nisha was talking about earlier. Uh, Filtrate brand makes a product that's an odor filter that has that carbon impregnated in the just the regular old furnace filter, and, and it will help to reduce uh, indoor pollutants as well. Okay. That, that's Great. a really good point. Um, your indoor <coughs> system is critical to this discussion. If you have a forced air system, um, what Brian is recommending is, I think, the right way to go. If you have a hot water or a steam heating system, of course, um, the air is not being passed through the filter. Mm -hmm. And that's where you right. really want to have um, uh, a machine somewhere. Um, $200 is probably high, 150 maybe. I, yeah. understand, I understand the difficulty of, of the cost issues. But and I, think and I, I do have a hillbilly fix solution straight from, you know, the, the Midwest here, if you, if you can't afford that. <laughs> um, so another question that I have, how would the typical homeowner know what their indoor air quality is? And I thought, you know, this is a good time to talk about the overall system in a home. You want to check the systems throughout your home on a regular basis in some cases annually at least. So there's your HVAC system, humidity levels. You wanna make sure the humidity, relative humidity in your home is between 30 and 50%. Uh, your smoke alarms, your carbon monoxide alarms, um, gas, you know, making sure you're getting your gas burning appliances checked uh, annually. Uh, radon, those are all things in the home that you can actually check for or get a test for. And so I really wanted to point that out um, uh, with regard to that question that you have to look at the home as a system or a set of systems when you are wondering if the air quality is, is sufficient. It's not just one thing or the other, it's, it's a system. Um, so I think next what we'll do is jump into a couple of mold questions um, and I'm going to kind of go um, and I thought a couple of them were really interesting, uh, Brian and Dr. Collins. Um, oh, I saw it. Goodness. Hold oh, just a sec. Oh, I had wood furniture. And mold growth once um, moved the furniture into my new home. <clears throat> I cleaned it with vinegar and water um, per the internet. I have not seen any more mold growth. Did I do the right thing? That's a great question. Um, I try to tell people to avoid worrying about doing, doing it the right way. So let's see, somebody told me the other day, it's better to do it the wrong way and try than to not do anything at all. So cleaning the surface was the right thing to do. Vinegar is a mild acetic acid solution, so it's not super effective against mold. Um, but if you clean the surface with any wet-based cleaning product and the mold hasn't come back, so if you keep kept it in a dry place, you're probably okay. Um, generally speaking, you want to clean with whatever you would normally clean that surface with. Vinegar and water is fine. And it shouldn't impact the interior of your home. I would encourage you if it's I'd have to know what the furniture was, but if it's a, a wood chair or a table, make sure that you look underneath. So a lot of times the most prevalent place for mold to grow are the places that you wouldn't normally look on the bottom side of the seat or on the bottom side of a table. Um, and if, you, if it's a wooden dresser, make sure you pull the drawers out and you actually look inside that thing and clean the inside because you can get mold on the inside of it that goes unaddressed. Um, but the vinegar and water is fine. I, I would, if it's wood, you've got to be careful that you don't leave residues on it. And if you wanted to use something that was natural, which is usually why people are using vinegar, you could use an essential oil-based product that's got thymol in it, which is a uh, thyme oil. 
or something that's got cinnamon oil in it. And those are both very effective fungicides that are, that are natural. Okay. We have, um, and it looks like we all got questions related to specific products that people were curious about. And for you all, they asked, do the bamboo charcoal air purifying bags work to reduce mold? Is there any risk associated with using them? You want to answer that one, Terry? Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I know. I just wanted. I'm if you wanted sorry, to but I'm sorry, but I don't know. Um, okay. You, uh, don't, the, you don't really want to be breathing charcoal dust, so it, uh, assuming that's not happening. But I'm sorry, I just don't know. Yeah, the bamboo charcoal filter. the The fact that it's bamboo is not super relevant. So you can make charcoal out of almost anything. And th in fact, I think there's a guy on YouTube that has a whole channel on just making bamboo out of stuff and he make or, or charcoal out of stuff. He makes charcoal out of weeds out in his back 40 and he makes charcoal out of just about everything. Um, they work fine. I, I doubt there's any risk to them. I agree with you that you want to avoid inhaling the particulate. So, so as long as the bag is sealed, it, it, there shouldn't be a major issue there. Uh, the problem with them is, is that there's no airflow through them. And so the actual amount of absorption that they're going to provide is much less than what you would get through a filter medium, which is designed for air to pass through it. So there, I, I don't know that there's any risk to them. I'm just not sure that they're super uh, efficient and they're, they tend to be pretty, pretty expensive for what they are. So a product question that I think was coming to me um, uh, many people have recommended burning sage and Palo Alto sticks is that recommended and I had never heard of Palo Alto sticks before this question and when I looked it up it actually said Palo Santo sticks and when I um, was reading more about it and, and what it actually entails in terms of um, burning this wood that acts like a type of incense um, a couple of red flags uh, went up for me. Uh, number one, UNC and other, uh, you know, research-based institutions are investigating incense as a problem uh, in terms of air quality for people who have asthma and, and allergy issues. So that's a red flag for me in, in the sense that Palo Santo seems to be considered a type of incense. And it's also a type of wood. And so if you'll recall earlier when I was talking about burning fuel, um, uh, you know, when you're producing something by burning wood, there is the possibility of putting particulate matter into the air, which means you're going to breathe tiny particles into your lungs that you cannot even see. Um, but it also can mean you, you could be producing carbon monoxide and, and other contaminants into the air. So I cannot, because I don't know enough about Palo Santo to say, no, you absolutely shouldn't use it. I can't say that. But I will say that it was a bit of a red flag when I was reading about it and noticed that it was a type of wood that's used like an incense. So, you know, I guess my best thing to say is that I guess I would be cautious um, about using products like that. Okay. Um, so uh, looking at um, additional mold questions, I have one here. Does treated and dead mold have to be scrubbed off surfaces where it has grown? Is it enough just to treat it? Um, that's going to depend on where the, the location's at, but treated and dead mold, regardless of the health impact, is very likely to be a resale issue. So if you're concerned about the sellability of your home, um, it's, it's always going to be an issue so long as you can see that there was a problem. You're eventually going to have to, somebody's going to have to resolve that. As far as the health consequences are concerned, um, there, if, if the particulate or the parts and pieces of the mold are still present. So if you've got mold spores that are non-viable, they're not going to grow new mold spores, but they're still present. Or you've got glucans or bits and pieces of, of the mold 
uh, organism itself that are left behind, those are still allergens. So they're still going to act in the body just like they would if it was a viable or a living mold. So you've still got to remove those, those parts and pieces in some way, shape, manner, or form. Um, I, I think that answers the question. Generally speaking, you, you really need to remove the, the, hypo, the, the mold growth that's on the surface has got to be removed. The staining that's left behind is probably not a health issue but it's definitely going to be a resale issue. Okay. Thank you. It looks like we're running pretty close to the end of the session. And so um, we just wanted to make sure that people know that we have all of your questions that you've been asking um, and that we will um, certainly um, follow up on these questions with answers that will be posted on the WHA resources website. Um, so I didn't want anyone to feel discouraged that your questions won't be answered. They certainly will be. And you see right here on this slide um, the uh, link to the site um, and the different resource categories that are highlighted on the site. Um, so Dr. Packingham? Um, thank you, Nisha, Dr. Collins, and Mr. Lester for such a wonderful webinar. I learned a lot, and I'm sure that the participants of this uh, webinar tonight also learned a lot. And as you said, Nisha, uh, you all did a fine job. Um, as you said, we have a tremendous list of environmental health resources as it relates to the topic that was the topics that were covered tonight. So I want people to be aware of the uh, website address that's on this slide, um, www.niehs.nih.gov backslash women's health awareness. And I think you will be pleased with that site. Also on the uh, resource uh, page, you will find information about COVID related concerns as it relates to um, indoor air quality and health. And once again, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. So um, I'm going to try to go on with what I have. I wanted to remind everyone that um, immediately after the webinar, evaluations will be sent via email. And so for completing the webinar um, and evaluation, you will receive educational contact credit hours for your participation. So it started again. So here we go. That's your slide. We also want to congratulate our October raffle winner, uh, Ms. Amber Lashley, who attended the October we webinar dealing with um, breast health, won the gift certificate uh, for that evening. And for those of you all who registered for the raffle, we will be doing the drawing probably tomorrow and we'll be in contact with you very soon about your gift certificate. So congratulations, Amber. Our next Women's Health Awareness Virtual Series webinar will be on understanding and reversing diabetes, heart disease, and most chronic illnesses. Uh, we wanted to be very respectful of your, your time. And so we know that the holidays are coming up so we decided not to have a webinar for December. Uh, this is an unusual time with uh, COVID and, and people are with their families. And so we wanted to be mindful of that. So our next webinar will be Thursday, January the 14th, 2021 from 6.30 to 7.45. Uh, Joyce Page from the Durham County Department of Public Health is the session chair. Um, and Dr. Alan Hatch, who is a cardiologist and medical director 
of the Saline Heart Group uh, of Saline Memorial Heart um, Saline Memorial Hospital from Benton, Arkansas, will be talking about how to uh, reverse diabetes, heart disease, and many chronic illnesses. Again, we want to thank you for your continued support and attendance of Women's Health Awareness. Thank you so much. Uh, continue to be safe. Um, and please go to our website for the question and answers, because all of the questions were not answered tonight, but they will be answered on the website. And for our health resources, um, also for a recording of this session. Thank you so much and have a great evening.